evening. At this time, we're going to call the Joint Board Committee meeting to order. Um, I do want to inform the public that this meeting is being broadcast on the Board of Supervisors Facebook page and also on YouTube, so it's live streamed. Uh, there are cameras all around, so you are being recorded. Just make sure everybody's aware of that. Um, so this is a joint board meeting. So you'll see up here on the, the stage area that you have board of supervisor members and also school board members. And that is because this board was formed to uh, come together to talk about the school's things that are happening and the county things and um, a way that we can work together and be more informed about what each body is working on. So that is why we're set up like this. School board members have been invited and also board of supervisor members have been invited. So this board needs to determine we've never had a section to receive public comments so we need to determine how we wish to do that it is my recommendation that we follow suit uh, like we do with the board of supervisors where citizens are given three minute time limit to come and address the board will everybody agree to that any discussion it's fine. Okay. i'd like to also suggest that it that it be just a public comment that we receive comment and that it not be a discussion back and forth that if any of the committee members or any of the board members who've been invited to attend want to take up one of the questions that the public might want to ask that we wait till that period and that they actually bring that question up so there won't be back and forth it'll just be listening on our part if i can amend your suggestion sure any further discussion any other suggestions I move that we uh, conduct the public hearing as described. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. That is how we will handle the public comment section of the agenda. Um, and I now I need a approval of the agenda. Make a motion that we approve the agenda for this evening. Oh, second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Perfect. Motion carries. Uh, moving on to the approval of the minutes. Any discussion? Madam Chair, I make a motion that we approve the minutes. Second. <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Your microphone's Madam, off. Madam Chair, my microphone's not working. Oh, you, you hit the power? I did. <laughs> I did. Oh. It's not working. You can all move down one. <laughs> okay, we'll down. All right, at this time, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Arnold. All right, okay. So in about a month ago, we were asked by the Board of Supervisors to come and discuss uh, some lessons that we, uh, we presented to our secondary students. And uh, this, after several iterations of this this is how we came to uh, present this and I'm going to go over where we started um, how far back we've started this process and where we are now and uh, then I think it will be going to public comment after that so this goes all the way back to April of 2015 uh, Amherst County Public Schools entered into an OCR agreement which is the Office of Civil Rights they uh, entered into that agreement because they were found the high school was found to have discriminated against students based on race by disciplining african-american students more harshly than their white peers and i'm reading that from the actual agreement and so as part of that agreement uh, there were several it's about a 16 page document and there are several things listed that the school system was required by federal law uh, to to do uh, with their students and with their staff in february of 2018 there was another agreement that was put in place it was called a continuation agreement which basically said this is what the school system commits to doing for the um, moving forward and so in august of 2019 the office of civil rights closed the monitoring portion of that agreement so uh, the reason i tell you that is because the agreement required several things but i'm only going to talk about a few of them uh, it required that staff and administration receive cultural competency and equity training it requires that uh, student forums will be held 
at the high school to allow students to share their concerns on a yearly basis. It required working groups uh, be formed to uh, review equity issues. And uh, currently, we're using our diversity council as part of uh, that review process. And the, to incorporate the Virginia tiered system of supports into the schools. And I bring that one up because it's, uh, it's important because this is a Virginia tiered system of supports. We, we said we would become VTSS schools. And um, it's a process to help schools work through change by using data to determine strengths and weaknesses in the following areas, behavior, academics, equity, social emotional learning. So uh, it's, it's really to be thought about as a process. The high school became a, a VTSS school in 2016. Our two middle schools joined on in 2019-20, and all of the elementary schools started this past year. Um, there's a division level team for VTSS, and each school has a, a school-based team. And school-based teams review their own data, and they determine needs at school. So an example of what they might do, uh, the high school maybe a couple years ago, they determined in looking at their discipline data that there were a lot of referrals that centered around profanity. And so the VTSS team put a plan together, they put lessons together to help curtail profanity. And so there, there are lots of examples of that, but that's one that, um, that comes to mind. So in the summer, this past summer in the fall, uh, there was, as you know, a lot of civil unrest in our country. And teachers in the United States and in Amherst uh, began worrying about the conversations that they were going to have to have with students. Uh, because students, when they come into our classrooms, they talk about what they're dealing with in their lives. And, and that was something that was very present in their lives at the time. So the VTSS school-based team started to think about what kind of support we could give staff in order to deal with this. And so that's really the genesis of the lesson itself. So the VTSS teams worked on that lesson during the fall. Uh, they provided, uh, they used resources provided by the Virginia Department of Education, the state superintendent, understanding that the need in the schools in the state that uh, he provided uh, resources for schools to use. And then our diversity council uh, reviewed the lesson uh, at the end. In early January, the school board uh, started to hear some concerns from staff and parents. And so they decided that they needed more information about the lesson. They um, thought that the timing, um, it was early January, that thought that the timing was uh, problematic, so they delayed the lesson. Um, it's important to note, though, that these VTSS lessons had previously never been shared publicly or with uh, the school board. They were just created in the schools and taught uh, to, the, to students. Um, so what ultimately happened was that after discussion and consideration by the board, they put certain criteria in place, certain conditions in place, in order to allow this lesson to move forward. So what uh, they asked us to do was to give parents and community access to the lesson and the ability to comment. Uh, we received 15 from uh, the entire community. We were asked to give parents an alternative lesson, uh, give students an alternative lesson. No, no student took advantage of those alternative lessons. And parents were given the right to opt their students out of the lesson, which 3% of our secondary students did. We also were asked to have qualified teachers teach these lessons. Once these conditions were met, the lessons were presented at the end of March. Um, before I discuss the lesson itself, um, please know, because there were questions about this, is that since January, our school board has discussed this in public at each of their five meetings. And so uh, there's been a lot of discussion around this. Um, and as part of that discussion and as part of hearing from community, they, they also asked that we put some certain some safeguards in, in place. And so one was that we are um, going to develop a policy that will make sure that the public and the board have access to any such lessons in the future and the ability to comment and review on them. 
They also uh, passed a regulation that would prohibit the school system from teaching critical race theory. And so uh, those are two things that the school board has already put in place to make sure that um, that we can move forward. And so let me talk a little bit about the equity lesson itself because I think there are several misconceptions about what it was. Uh, the way we look at equity in Amherst County for our schools is that equity is providing every student exactly what they need to be successful. This is not a new concept. We have been providing services for special education students for decades. And so that, if you think about equity in those terms, that's what we're, we're trying to, to uh, help our students with. And so the goal of this lesson was to give students the tools to do a better job hearing their neighbors, working through differences in a civilized manner to find solutions to very real and complex problems. The lesson itself was designed to allow students to study an event in our history so they could see how different media perspectives really impacted how the incident uh, was resolved. They were able to make connections to issues today that have several different perspectives and to develop ideas on how to study all sides of an issue prior to passing judgment about that issue. So um, the, the lesson talked about the historical event. It was called the Greensboro Massacre, which occurred in the, in the 70s. And the Communist Workers Party, uh, they were having a march and they clashed with uh, Ku Klux Klan group and several people were killed during this, uh, this clash. The students received eight different media perspectives at the time that were uh, presented so students could see how difficult it was to come to any resolution on that incident. And as a matter of fact, it ultimately required a commission be put together uh, and it w the resolution came 25 years later. So I'd like for people to know that when we surveyed, 83% of staff and students found benefit to this lesson. Um, and so that, in, in its essence, was what we were trying to accomplish with the equity lesson. Um, that occurred in March. Uh, but what I thought would be important for this group and our community to understand, so that lesson was, was born from our OCR and what we were trying to accomplish with OCR agreement. What's coming in the future has more to do with what the state of Virginia has done in terms of passing uh, law. So I'm going to go over three laws that have just uh, recently been passed um, and give you some of the relevant details of it because I think it, it, it is in line with what we're talking about here tonight. So the first was called the Culturally Relevant and Inclusive Education Practices Advisory Committee. So this is a statewide committee that is uh, by law required to be formed and to present recommendations on uh, inclusive practices to the state uh, Virginia Department of Education state superintendent. The group was formed in September of 2020 and those recommendations came to the state superintendent uh, to be implemented in March. And so some of them were uh, incorporation of equity in the standards of learning, uh, requirement for school division to adopt an equity plan and establish an equity advisory committee, the inclusion, uh, inclusion of an indicator on disproportionality and disciplinary outcomes as a factor in our school accreditation. Um, they also put a teacher diversity index on the, our school quality profile expressing student-teacher racial ratios in the form of a uh, single indicator related to teacher and student demographics. So basically saying if our, our school system has uh, X percent of students that are in a minority that they would want that to be reflected in our staff. And so those are some of the things that have come from uh, the state of Virginia as uh, it was passed last year. Uh, another bill that was amended and uh, passed was the uh, one relating to teacher licensure and evaluation. And so uh, starting 
we are we are of the understanding that we're going to get the training uh, materials in late December, and so this won't start until 2022. But teachers will be required uh, to receive cultural competency training every two years. Uh, teachers will be evaluated uh, through the state evaluation system on on those those competencies, and then history teachers seeking initial licensure will have to get instruction and training in uh, those competencies. So, um, and then the, the last one was that uh, this past spring, social emotional learning um, standards were to be developed and released, and we, we believe they're coming in July, uh, social emotional standards. So those are three rather large things that uh, we're being asked to do by the uh, Virginia Department of Education and Virginia Code. So ultimately tonight, we're going to hear from a lot of citizens, and you will have different perspectives and opinions. And it is my hope that we're able to share these things in a respectful manner. I see this as an opportunity for Amherst County to model for our students the exact lesson that we presented in March. Thank you. Board, any questions for Dr. Arnold before we open it up for you? Yeah, Madam Chair, I do have a couple of questions. So on the diversity training that you said would be implemented in March, and in part of that, you have to have staff that reflects the diversity of the population. Was the Monacom, Monacom Tribal Council, have they been considered and talked to about and communicated to with this as well? Right, because we have um, the, there's a, um, something that we're putting in place where we're working with the the, um, the monicans and it's actually the um, it's an education consortium of all uh, indigenous tribes but since we have monican in amherst county that we are they they're trying to get us to pass a resolution that we will work and provide resources for them so we can help give them some resources to to help with attaining teachers and training teachers. So in the current classes that have been ongoing, are the Monicans, can have, been, have they historically been considered in those classes? Uh, this one lesson that we taught? Yes. No. Okay. Last question. Of the 83% that responded favorably, how many people, how many staff and students actually responded? Because if it's 83% of 50%, then right. that's one thing. Right. It's 83 percent of 100 percent. That's I'll look while okay. the Thank night you. goes on. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Thompson. Um, I I may be wrong on this. Um, I believe there's about 400 responses out of Is about right? 2,000. 443. 443 yeah, so out of. Um, 2,200. 2,200. So, so 83 percent of that is a relatively small number. Yeah, about a fifth. Thank you. About a fifth. Um, also, I had a question. Um, you mentioned the VTSS um, that we committed to under the OCR agreement, um, and they commended us for that being a voluntary agreement that we're using VTSS. Does that remain voluntary today? I believe so. Okay, and is that through a grant funding? Okay. Um, also, um, Virginia Department of Education, um, they do provide resources and links. And I know that the lesson that was presented was provided on the Virginia Department of Education website. I'm not sure that that is where it originated. Do you know where it originated? Mm -hmm. I'll put it in the answers. It was mm -hmm. learning for justice. Mm -hmm. Learning, learning yeah. for justice. Right, learning for justice dot org. Okay. Um, I believe that's all I have for now. Board, any other questions? I got a couple of questions. Um, you went through the requirements that you, you, and you listed those that you thought were most relevant. One was uh, staff and administrative training that would be required, student forums that would be required, uh, working groups, which you all have created a diversity council. Uh, and then you talked at length about the Virginia tiered system of supports, VTSS, which, which as I understood the explanation, uh, they're, they're looking at data and then they make recommendations. 
I didn't hear you say anything that actually required that these lessons be given. No. So there is no re actual requirement that they be given? No, that wasn't a requirement. It's okay. a requirement to, to have those things in place. Right, right. but not to give these lessons. Right. Okay. Oh, no, there was no requirement to put those lessons in place. That's all. Anything else before we open it up? Ms. Thompson? Uh, one additional question. Um, the February 15th, 2018 um, document where um, we have listed some agreements, once the OCR uh, agreement was ended, we have some agreements that we would carry forward. Right. I do see on there that we would be providing through the VTSS a data informed decision framework, those things that you mentioned. There is no time limit on this. So have we actually entered into an agreement for eternity or does this have so a time So I wasn't limit? in the system at that time, so um, maybe Ms. Jennings, who's standing outside, well, might be able to answer that. Let me, let me help you out. You can come on in, Holly. I'm not going to do my comments right now, but I will. I was here. Uh, we're talking about OCR at this time, Madam Vice. Uh, yes, this was the agreement okay. after we had been in released. Uh-huh. Um, these oh, no, no, no. There was not. No, this was the agreement in February that that's what we continue doing. We would continue to do that, but right. there's no time limit to that. In other words, the OCR is going to hold us right. accountable to these with no time limit. That's correct. That's right. So a lot of school divisions are never released from OCR agreements. They're held in them until either their data shows they need to no longer be in agreement or they come to some final resolution of these are the practices we will continue in our school division in order to be released from their monitoring. Um, those were the things that we agreed that would become permanent practices in Amherst County Public Schools in order for us to be released. Um, in order to stay under the OCR agreement, it cost a great deal of time and money as far as the staff trainings that are required. We had to bring in experts from outside the school division. Um, we utilized the resources from UVA at that period of time. Um, some of those things were very costly and very timely when we had to submit that information. So it was more beneficial to the school division to permanently adopt the practices that were being required by the federal government um, than to continue on indefinitely with their monitoring and supervision. And I, I know the original OCR agreement is quite a lot of pages. You could probably tell me how many there are. Um, as I read this entire document, it talks about our discipline policies, and I understand that's what brought us to the OCR. Um, and I'm not seeing anything in the original agreement that goes beyond us looking at our discipline data and working towards that end. So would it be reasonable to assume that when we're looking at an agreement that follows this, that it too would be tied to our discipline data? Well, yes and no. So the part of the agreement that's not directly tied to the discipline data is, I believe it's item number three or four, I'd have to look at it, but it talks about analyzing the root causes for the reasons why we were having is issues in our discipline. Um, so we had to do a thorough analysis of all of the root causes. And so there were three different things that were, were discussed. One was policies procedures and practices. So that goes directly to our discipline policies. The other two issues surrounded supports for students. So what are we doing to assist students um, in preventing behavior? So instead of just being reactive to behavior, what are we doing to prevent it? That is why we agreed to voluntarily become part of the Virginia tiered system of support. That's a tiered system of support um, that helps students by providing lessons, a data framework, figuring out what's going on so that we can prevent those problems before they occur. And then the third piece of that was looking at staff bias or um, looking at the adults in the building from administrators, um, teachers, custodians, bus drivers, everyone to kind of figure out is there implicit bias happening. Um, that was the third piece of it. What was tied to that was a whole lot of training. And I see a lot of Amherst folks in the room. They're probably nodding their head if they've been here for a while. We had training from the high school all the way down to the elementary school. And even the school board was required to participate in those trainings regarding implicit bias. 
um, and that was the piece that we agreed to continue to move forward. Um, and part of what we did in agreeing to be a VTSS school division is there are five components that are involved in VTSS. That would be academic, behavioral, equity, family engagement, and social emotional learning. VTSS provides those trainings to school divisions for free. So we were looking to save the county money because we were going to be required to continue to do those trainings. So we entered into VTSS prior to getting out of the OCR agreement. So we were still being monitored by OCR at that time when we joined to be a VTSS cohort to try to alleviate some of the expense that goes along with being trained um, for all of those required components that we were required to train staff for. Um, prior to that, Dr. Bob, Bob Colbert out of UVA was doing those trainings along with Dr. McFadden, who was uh, a staff member of us with us at that time. And, and I do appreciate looking to save money, um, but my experience with VTSS as well as what's documented here is that it revolves around discipline. And you've even alluded to that fact. So if we're talking about implicit bias within our staff, um, that data, I'm assuming, was collected prior to training to show that we needed to have the training, and I'm assuming it was collected afterwards to show that we have grown. Do you have that data that, that data that you provided to the board? That data was collected through discipline, um, and so there were two components of that. That was referral data. So who is being referred to the office? What are they being referred for? That was the data that was used to determine that. And then the other piece of that, which is more the behavioral piece, um, that data is collected after the behavior has come to the office and been processed by the administrator. So there's kind of two pieces of that data. We have continued to collect that data every year since we were released. And I understand that the agreement says that you will discuss that with principals after every semester? Yes, ma'am. Have you already discussed that with the principals this semester? We have not discussed that this year because behavior has been very minimum this year. There has been literally very few behavioral referrals this year due to the way school has been structured. However, we do have those conversations with our administrators at the end of every semester. And I, and I know I've asked for that data and Dr. Arnold is assuring me that you're getting that for me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Could you identify the speaker for us all, please? I'm, Ho I'm Dr. Holly Jennings. I'm the Supervisor of Discipline and Compliance for Amherst County Public Schools. Board, any other Questions, comments? Thank you, Ms. Jennings. Yes. All right, at this uh, time, we're going to open the floor for uh, public comments. I will remind you that it is a three minute time limit. The buzzer will go off. Um, and that is to remain consistent and fair and give everybody an opportunity to speak. Um, okay. No, she. Okay, so we're just going to have to go by uh, whoever reaches the podium first. Don't hurt anybody. Um, <laughs> So if there's anybody here wishing to address the board, you'll come forward. You'll state your name and address for the record. My name is Amy Whitaker, and I'm going to talk very quickly so to make the three minutes. So here we go. There is a force, a creature among us that wishes to strip us of our individual choices, our personal decision-making power, and our ability to think for ourselves. This force is known as government. Government wants every part of you. It consumes everything it touches. It desires every part of your life. There is no corner of the world that it does not yearn for. It desires our children from the moment they walk into elementary school. This creature, this governmental force, has crept its way into academia and rooted its fingers into our most precious resource, our youth, your children. It starts small and festers throughout their college years with a simple goal, to inject your children with Marxist claptrap and turn them against the values that they were taught at home. It sinks its teeth into students and is too often successful in its purpose of turning young people away from personal responsibility, reason, and truth. The proposed equity lessons are a clever ploy to convince students that they are guilty of crimes that they did not commit, that they are responsible for the actions of others, and that certain groups are inherently racist. It boldly describes itself as the obvious right thing to teach, but a closer look at these lessons reveals the truth, that it is nothing but indoctrination. It aims for equality of outcome, not equality of opportunity. 
To adopt lessons that propose social justice rather than just justice is to abandon free will, personal responsibility, and the path of the individual. We have a duty to defend our most precious resource, our young people. We have a responsibility to do what is right. We must, at any cost, fend off those who would have the next generation be brainwashed to believe that they are responsible for the past. Rest assured, there is no equity in this curriculum, only undue guilt, undeserved suffering, and the undermining of parents. I urge the boards to stand up for what is right, what is just, what is fair that we teach our children that their success in life will be determined by their individual choices in their hard work, no matter what their background, skin color, or creed. I urge the boards to see through this veil of deceit and send this nonsense as far away from our youth as possible. Recognize the evil that is in our midst and defend our future. And in the alternate lesson, you will find, uh, you will find stereotypes uh, in the alternate lesson, lesson is labeled stereotypes, I, I found to be a grave concern. You will find the words gender identity and sexual orientation. While equity lessons promote cultural Marxism, this alternate lesson promotes spiritual and cultural rot. Isaiah 520 reads, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Thank you. Madam Chair, <laughs> did she give her address? Oh, no. Cancel it. It's uh, 113 Lancaster Drive in Madison Heights. Thank you. You see the cancel button there? Yeah, I see the cancel <laughs> button. But... Hello, everyone. My oh, name is. Hang on just a second. I'm going to make sure we got the timer ready, make sure it's fair. Excuse me. We're good now? Good. Okay. You can state your name and address. My name is Susan Agati, and I live at 145 Mill Race Drive. I am a previous teacher in the county and a parent of two students who will both be attending Amherst County High School in the fall. It is important that members of both boards hear from parents who are in support of equity lessons. If black, indigenous, and other students of color in Amherst County are old enough to experience racism, then white students in Amherst County are old enough to learn about those experiences. I realize that anything I could say to educate you about critical race theory and white privilege will fall on deaf ears. You have made up your mind, and that is evident in the power play you used on May 18th to vote to delay approving the school board's budget for the upcoming school year. I want to say shame on you. This is why a group of us worked hard to switch the school board to an elected body. We wanted them out from under your influence. The board can continue to try and keep Amherst County as a backwards place, but there are many of us, and our numbers are growing, that want to see Amherst become a safe and a happy place for all residents. That starts by teaching our children how to respect and accept one another regardless of race, class, religion, gender, or sexuality. The school board's answers to your 25 frankly insulting questions do an excellent job of dispelling the myths around the equity lesson. Your questions are demonstrative of your biases towards many members of this community. I hope that you are satisfied with the responses you received and will stop holding teachers and families in this community hostage and approve the budget for the upcoming school year. And Black Lives Matter. Hi, I'm Andrea Talley. I live on Kenmore Road. We're going to need your full address. Uh, 869 Kenmore. So over the past several weeks, I've heard from fellow parents and students of Amherst County who's concerned about the lessons being taught in our local schools. They said these lessons were presented as a one-day equity lesson to bring forth discussion among students, except that was not the case. Yes, there was a lesson about a past historical event and media bias. Yes, there was a discussion, except it did not end there. You see, in my son's English class, has he had any books assigned this year? Nope. Not one. Has he written any essays, you know, and expositories, compare contrast, literature analysis? No, nope. not one. But let me tell you what he's doing in his English class. In his English class, he is learning about wealth redistribution, fairness in America based on a person's socioeconomic background and ethnicity. And he actually had to work on an assignment where he used to choose four people out of 14 to die based on their career, 
their sexual orientation, their ethnicity, their political affiliation, whether they were a supporter of white supremacy or Black Lives Matter, their IQ, medical history, and their age. So for people to say that we are non-discriminatory, that everything is equal, then why did my son have this assignment? My son did his PowerPoint on all life being valuable. He refused to choose four individuals. I commend him for that. Except the teacher said that's not allowed. He must choose four <coughs> excuse me, individuals based on the information given for each of them. So he decided if he must choose, he would assign each individual a number and he'd use a Google num um, number generator to see which one would die. Except there was a problem. The teacher told him that wasn't allowed either when he sub submitted his project, so he received a zero. He completed the assignment. He said all life was valuable. He received a zero. I have an honors student. He has a 4.2 GPA. My son will not be returning next year. So my question to you all is this. I'm a 40-year-old Native American Caucasian female I have autoimmune diseases. I was raised by a single mom. I had an alco alcoholic father. He was very abusive. I have a degree in microbiology and clinical laboratory sciences. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, been married to my best friend for 19 years, and I consider myself a conservative. So, would I be one of the four you killed? If that makes you uncomfortable, then why was my 15-year-old asked that same question? There's anybody else that wishes to address the board? Hi, my name is Laura Knopf. I live at Five. You have to speak into the microphone. Sorry, everybody okay. can hear you. My name is Laura Knopf. I live at 506 Peters Hollow Road, Monroe, Virginia. And I'm here today because I have a real strong interest in this. Um, my, I raised my children here. I've been living here for 44 years. And my, my career was Child Protective Services. So this is extremely um, important to me. I what, couldn't figure out why we didn't have parents coming. I was out in the community and I couldn't figure it out. And finally I learned they were afraid to come. So on Friday, on Saturday night, I called somebody and said, I want to you know, do a petition. I want to go to people's houses and ask them to sign this. So I did, and I'm going to give this um, <coughs> report to you to take and look at. I was able to just, and again, this was, for, I got up Sunday morning and started, and yesterday was a holiday, but I managed to get 63 signatures on this, and I will continue to do this. I'm not stopping this, so you'll hear from me later. And then last time I was here, I gave reading that I had I thought was important, and I want to share that. Probably the petition too, if you're turning that in, right? Will she get the petition too? Are you turning that in now? I think they have it here. The lady in the black mask. Front row. Front row. Right there. She's keeping her notes. Is there anybody else wishing to address the board? Just you state your name and address for the record. Oh, you can speak, you just have to state your name and address. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kimberly Dyke Harsley L. 
and I am working at Ally Cab, 2109 12th Street, Lynchburg, Virginia. Dr. Arnold, first. We, the Ani Yunwea, Aborigines of Amherst County, commonly called Cherokee speaking people, appreciate you for including in your response all indigenous tribes. Thank you. Due to the treacherous practices of one Walter Plecker, many of us were and still are misnomered as Negro, Black, Colored, and now African American. Over the decades, I can't remember because it started before my time, but during my time in public school, as well as my own children, there were lies by omission taught in his story classes. There were half-truths taught, probably still are, if they're the same textbook writers. Where was the meeting for those children who were harmed by those lies and those half-truths? Where was the inclusion in those books? If one is complicit in teaching those lies by omission and those half-truths, then I say you seem to be just as guilty as the writers of the textbook. The psyche of some children have been harmed one way or the other. Some may seem or think that their children are made to feel guilty. How were other children made to feel all of these decades? I think the focus should go prior to now. There needs to be a stand-up, speak-out session about the lies written in the his story books. They need to be changed. And if it doesn't happen, go somewhere else. Pull your children out. Go somewhere else. Go home. Mother is the first teacher. Thanks. Hello. Can I reach? Hello. You should be able to move it down a little bit. There you go. My name is Carolyn Gross. I'm a college professor, have been for over 30 years in different uh, uh, states, and now I'm here in Virginia. But I was raised here in Amos County, went to Amos County schools um, from the second grade until, high to, to, until I graduated. I experienced a lot in this county, and I learned more about Central Virginia when I went away to graduate school. There were so many things I didn't know, and that included Amherst County. I, when I teach, I, I do teach a class titled Race and Ethnicity. I've had police officers in those classes. I've had firefighters in those classes. I've had central nurses in those classes because I wanted them to learn to respect the people that they were hired to serve. I tell my students even today, I don't want to turn out ignorant people with degrees. That's not what education is for. And so I would always look through my daughter's textbook, who, by the way, went to Amherst County Schools as well, and I would see the things that were being omitted that I know she should know, as well as the other kids in the schools, and that their parents simply didn't want to tell them or probably didn't know because they didn't learn it in school either. That's all we're asking, especially people of color, which in definitely includes indigenous people. I always, even as I teach college, have to have my students research indigenous tribes in the United States. And I've had, and I still have students from Amherst County who are telling me, because I'm teaching a class now, I didn't know we had 
an Indian tribe in Amherst County. So ignorance tends to perpetuate itself when you don't have an educated citizenry. And that includes lessons and hard lessons, not glossed over sweetie pie lessons because life wasn't easy for anybody, in particular, all people of color. People struggle. People are still struggling. But our students should know the truth, as hard as it may be. And for people who already have privileges, share the wealth. Thank you. Ms. Rose. Ms. Rose, we need your address for the record. Can I ask? Because the, we were. Oh, you're not going to get me hate mail. <laughs> Town Girls 2636 Goss Mill Road. Well, that's what ignorant people will do. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello, my name is Karen Angulo. I actually live in Appomattox, considered a lot of properties over here in Amherst. Now I'm wondering whether I really would ever move here. Um, am I allowed to speak? Because a couple of people here were not in Amherst. Who spoke? Can I speak, please? Sure. Thank you. And I just want to thank the last two speakers for pointing out some of those old textbooks that I've, that I've looked at. They really are bad. They really need to be changed. I mean, they're, they're really, really atrocious. But honestly, that's not really the, the point here. It's looking at this current teaching that has come out. Call it critical race theory. Call it culturally responsive training. Any of those things. It's not what people think it is. I mean, everyone who remembers the, the fight for civil rights from the 50s and the 60s, I mean, the people who marched in the streets and struggled for school desegregation, really respect those people. You know, but they, they really should be furious at what's going on. Because um, all of that's being overturned. You know, Martin Luther King's movement was all about racial tolerance. It was about coming together. It was about finding a way forward. It was about measuring individual character, regardless of skin color. But the opposite of what Martin Luther King has stood for is being um, pushed today. It's racial hate and racial divide. Back in California, they've removed Martin Luther King and um, uh, Frederick Douglass Jr. from their school systems. You know, why would they do that? You know, if your goal really is to stop discrimination on the basis of race, then stop discriminating on the basis of race. But that's what CRT, again, whatever you want to call it, that's what it does. It's designed to divide us. It's a divide and conquer straight out of Karl Marx himself. It's a cancer for our children. Just remember all the insecurities you had when you were growing up. Right now you're going to teach the white kids that the only reason they can succeed is not through their own hard work, but because of white supremacy and patriarchy. And then, here's how it's totally racist. You're going to teach the black kid, actually all the other kids, you're going to teach them that, um, that they're a victim, that they're always going to be a victim, and that everybody who looks at you only sees the color of your skin. This is entirely racist teaching. And, you know, it's just, it's just, um, you know, the, the other kids are, you know, are really the white kids always looking at the color of your skin and judging you that way? It's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. What kind of twisted, sick monsters would do this to children? I should say enough. Just enough of this stuff. You know, but who's pushing CRT? Right, obviously it started in the universities a long time ago. And now it's throughout our culture, government, entertainment, churches. Some are pushing it for ideological reasons. Others, maybe they're limousine liberals who just want a virtue signal about how woke they are. But then there's the others. There's the race hustlers and the grifters. In Loudoun County, they found that there was a ridiculous training, a slave game, seriously, it was stupid. And yet... Uh, a complaint was, was given to uh, the Attorney General in Virginia, um, and actually the, the NAACP was a, a party of that, plus a whole bunch of other people, because it really was a stupid training. But the agreement had them give training that cost money, and the people who benefited were the people who complained. you got to stop this. you got to wonder, who's paying for this? Thank you, Ms. Karen. You need to FOIA. You need to FOIA your county and see how much is being spent on this training. Who's benefiting? 
who's benefiting from this training. You guys got to do it. Thank you. And you're very vulnerable legally. Thank you. Civil Rights Act. Civil Rights Act. Fourteenth Amendment. First Amendment. You guys are going to go bankrupt. My turn. Sure. There you go. Sorry. Sorry. Name and address. Barbara Pryor, 2464 Puppy Creek Road, Amherst. Um, I want to commend the board and the supervisors for having this meeting, no matter how hostile it gets or how frustrated we get. This is what we need to be doing, talking about these issues. Our country is at a pivotal moment. We are either going to go through and have a future for our children and our grandchildren, or we're not. We can slide backwards or we can slide forward. And when I hear the word equity, I see fairness. And I also think of the word empathy, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Now, my ancestors' bones are all over Amherst and Albemarle and the counties before. And my ancestors probably were involved in killing the, the families of the Cherokees and the Monicans and the other indigenous people. My family's own slaves, which is one reason probably why I was able to inherit a little money. It was inherited off the backs of wealth created by slavery. I have been to multiple Black Lives Matter movements, meetings, and I have never once been appreciated for anything but love and the fact that I'm there. There has been never any moment you owe me something. What we're trying to do with the equity movement, and I can't commend you, and there will be flaws. The lady whose son got the zero, maybe instead of taking her child out of the schools, could contact the school board and say, look, maybe this could be done better. Okay, well then we... Maybe we need to, maybe this is the public forum that will make that happen. But for me, racism is like a cancer. And unless we pull it out of our system and look at it for what it is, we are going to continue to perpetuate it. And we are not, we are not, and let them not fool you, we are not responsible for what our ancestors did. We are only responsible for what we choose today to do to make this country better for all of us. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Steve Barnes with 573 Blue Ridge Lane, Monroe. Um, my wife's been a teacher in the county since 2009. She'll retire next year. Um, Ms. Tucker made the comment, and some people got to get a lot of it, that 83% of 400 is a small number. Well, 17% of 400 of over 2,000 is a very small number. And look at, this, look at this room. This is the same county I came to in 2007 when President Obama was inaugurated. You sent home opt-out forms because people didn't want their kids seeing the first black president inaugurated on TV at school. Y'all need to think a lot about what's going on in this county. Hello. Hi. My name is Mark Reed. Uh, I live in Lexington, Virginia. I don't live in Amherst County. Uh, I'm running for the House of Delegates. Uh, if or when I'm elected, um, I would represent Amherst County. Uh, I have knocked on hundreds of doors in Amherst, um, all of the other counties in this area. I have never, not one person, and, and I don't target Republican doors or Democrat doors or socialist doors or, or whatever. I just knock on doors, walk in a neighborhood, knock on doors. I have never, ever, as one person suggested that what you're doing here, or what they're doing in Lexington where I live, or Rockbridge County, or that nobody has ever suggested to me that this is a good idea. Nobody. Like I said, I have knocked on hundreds of doors. I am a career social worker, a career child protective services investigator. I can tell you that in half an hour, 
83% of the time, I can convince somebody of my way of thinking, if they're a child, elementary age, middle school age, high school age. I can convince them to come around my way of thinking. These terms that you're using here, they're just terms, they're words, the definitions. The, this is not curriculum, and those are not curriculum terms. Those are agenda terms. If you feel the need to teach these things, you need to ask, them, ask yourselves, what were you teaching before, and why did you do such a poor job of it that you felt you had to improve on it? Because you've been doing this for a long time, right, since 2015, or whenever you had your problems. You don't need to really, it, it, it's not that difficult to fix. You just teach. You go to college for it, you learn, you, you, you go to school just like your children go to school, these children go to school, our children go to school. That's all, it, it's not, it really isn't rocket science or algebra or math or English. Treat people the right way. Then get, out of the, get that out of the way and teach your math and your English and your social studies, your science, whatever else you should teach, but don't tell me that the Virginia Department of Education is not providing critical race theory as part of its resources for teachers in the state of Virginia, because they are. They are. I can show you where. I can show you where. So thank you, all of you. Hello. Hi. My name is Lillian Johnson. I live at 449 Christian Springs Road, Amherst, Virginia. Orson Welles said that when there's a gap between one's real and one's declared aims, one turns instinctively, instinctively to long words and exhaustive idioms, like a cuttlefish squirting out ink. I read the SELs, and I studied about three or four pages of it, and it's just too many words, and it leaves everything open-ended. You never know what they've really said, and it can mean uh, several things, and it leaves it open for whatever anybody wants it to be. Uh, Ms. Thompson, I, I wanted to ask you something. You said that you got your information from learning, learning um, what was the... Um, the I'll, ha I'll have to ask. Learn, no, it wasn't learning for. Was it learning for justice? Well, they are. Com I've, I've got the information. I just left it in the car, and I should have brought it. But they are affiliated with the Black Lives Matter agenda, and it was. It's pretty, um, pretty specific what they're about. I also have their lesson plans out in the car because I didn't want to bring them in get in a fight. But Wednesday's lessons plans for pre-K through uh, third grade is the gender identification, it is queer affirming, trans affirming, and role playing. And that's the agenda for the Wednesday's teaching. I find that very disturbing and I went further with it to find out exactly what was going on. And they have a, um, a very specific teaching. And they're teaching little children to specifically explore their own sexuality. Now this is pre-K through three. They shouldn't even be burdened with this garbage. I'm sorry, this is very, very uh, abnormal. When they get up to higher grades, and not, not seniors and juniors, they're introduced to sex toys. Now, people, we don't need that kind of stuff. And this is Marxist stuff. 
I'm yeah. sorry, but Marx, uh, Patrice Cullors is a trained Marxist, and she was head of the Black Lives Matter group, that I'm all for Black Lives Matter, but not the group that she has taken over and has raised over $90 million from people who... No, I didn't set the timer on her. It's doing it on its own now. Oh. <laughs> You got like 10 seconds, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, she has absconded with a lot of money buying $4 million homes. And this is not what you want. There's an investigation going on, and it hasn't been resolved yet. Uh, oh, thank you, Ms. I, Ms. Johnson. <laughs> okay, I, I will. I do want to say that I, I oppose blatant uh, racism in every way possible. But I don't want to go this road and use racism to try to solve racism. It doesn't work. Martin Luther King. Thank you, Ms. Work. Johnson. Hello. Hi. My name is Rita Hartless. I live at 1803 Lake Mariner Drive in Forest, Virginia, but I taught in Amherst County for 34 years. And I think one thing we're forgetting here are the children. And I tried very hard, I have a few here, to be very, very, very fair. I accepted my children as they were, regardless, when they walked through my door. And that's what I wanted to say, that if you give the, the teachers a chance, we're going to teach these children and we're going to accept them. But now I'm angry and I have to say something about something that I'm sure you're a fabulous lady. Um, my daughter, even though we live in Forest, graduated from Amherst County High School. And as it turns out, she defines herself as asexual. And she very much needed to be treated fairly, treating someone differently because they have sexual differences is a type of racism. You don't have to be black, indigenous, poor, whatever, to be treated differently. Um, when I was there, because of the VTSS study program, Pam Lobb and I, because student asked for it, started a program for students who needed to be safe because they had problems with their sexuality. I'm probably, I'm 99% sure that that program doesn't exist now because she and I are no longer there. And parent teachers are afraid to accept that because they are afraid of how they would be treated. But children exist who have problems with their sexuality, and they need to be treated with respect also. All lives matter, black, white, African, oh, I'm sorry, that's black. I, I'm so upset right now. My daughter had a very difficult life at Amherst County High School that I did not realize because of her sexuality. And I think that we need to accept individuals because we are all different. We are not ever going to all be alike. And we can't put ourselves in little boxes and expect us all to be alike. And lesson plans are not going to make us all alike. But this particular lesson plan needed to be discussed by many people, members of the community, administration, teachers. And I will say this, I live, I live in Forest. I loved teaching in Amherst County. I love the people. I love the students, but many, many times when decisions were made, the teachers were not asked, and they need to be. Hello. Hello. My name is Cheryl Fales. I live in Amherst, Virginia. I live at 950 Indian Creek Road in District 2. I have been an employee of Amherst County for about 20 years. And uh, just to kind of set up who I am, I've worked in corporate before, and I've also worked in critical communications, working with the federal government uh, in the project management sector. 
I currently um, am employed, obviously, at Amherst County High School. I teach U.S. history, I teach government, I teach sociology, and I teach African American studies. I have two children that graduated from Amherst County High School who had phenomenal teachers. My son lives in Alaska. My daughter is at UVA. When she graduated Amherst County High School, she went to Hollins University. She got a phenomenal degree. Um, our little school uh, gave her, and thank you, Miss Hartless and everyone in here, who were a part of her life and my son's life too. Uh, this county is a beacon, and we need to remember that. We are a beacon. It is okay to have disagreements sometimes. It is okay to have a dialogue. But what we need right now is unity and solidarity. We need to come together in a discussion. We need to down-regulate a little bit. I was part of the original VTSS team, served on that team for two years. I was also part of mindfulness training, which I paid for out of my own pocket. Now, why did I do this? I did this for my students because each student, every child every day, is important to me. I understood that as a teacher, that I needed to interact differently because our society was becoming upregulated. Okay? We needed a time where we had to kind of control ourselves a little bit. I needed to interact differently with my students. I didn't need to become upregulated because of profanity, which, by the way, is a sign of being upregulated. That means that your amygdala is basically running your fear flight fight system and you no longer have your thinking brain it's called your survival brain so this is what we're trying to do in amherst county is to provide opportunity for every child every day your dialogue your opinions are important to us if you don't like textbooks I've never known a time in 20 years where we haven't had open textbook adoptions where you as public could come in, look at the textbooks, and evaluate them. In fact, currently I'm working with some members in this audience right now on our African American studies. We are undergoing textbook adoption, and they are part of that. But I want to bring us back center. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate what it. What have we done Appreciate in this it. county? Thank you. This is a time for celebration. This is a time to thank every one of our parents, our students. Is there anybody here uh, wishing to address the board still? Good evening. Um, my name is Ron Carter. I live in Appomattox, 211 Azalea Lane. Um, I've been in public education for 30 years, 25 years here in Amherst County. Um, yes, I have a prepared statement, but um, listening to people talk, um, we really don't have an issue with the school system and the teachers in the school system uh, and, and being nice to students and treating students fairly. That's not the problem. Uh, the problem and the concern for, I think, many people in this room is what's being handed down to us from the federal government and the state government. That's where the issues are. If it were just all about teaching history, yes, we can get that straight on our own. If it's about how to treat other people, yes, we can get that straight on our own. As a follower of Christ, I know how to conduct myself when I live in my society. I know how to conduct myself because I have biblical principles that guide me and lead me in that direction. I do not need, and I'm going to say it, a Marxist ideology being handed down <laughs> to tell me how to teach children. We have to have a moral compass. We can't go by what every other person thinks is right or wrong. If we don't stand on biblical principles, we're going to fail. 
Amherst County has the opportunity to set the standard. Amherst County can lead the way in the state of Virginia. We can be the example of the school system that wants to put God first in what they do. We don't have to say yes to everything the government hands down to us. We don't have to. We can make decisions based on godly principles and I believe that is the way we should be guiding our children, not based on the ideologies that are being handed down through government. Thank you. Oh. Hi. My name is Michelle Gazzardo. I live at 116 You might Mulberry. have to get closer to my down. Everybody can hear you. My name is Michelle Gazzardo. I live at 116 Mulberry. I've heard a lot of different things, and it comes down to me, what does my children get out of school? What do they get? I have kids that are smart, and they're fun, and they're understanding, and they just love people, whoever they are. They just want to learn. They want to learn with people that want to work. They want to learn with people that are like them, that aren't going to disrupt. I had in... In kindergarten, my daughter came home. Her best friend was a black boy. He came to her and said, I can't marry you. My daddy says, you're, you're white, I can't marry you. In kindergarten. My daughter said, okay, we'll be friends. <laughs> in high school, fast forward in high school, she hated her Spanish class, could not stand her Spanish class. When I asked her why, because there was a child in her class that all he did was interrupt. He was white. It didn't matter their color. It didn't matter who they were. She just wanted to be with somebody who learned. My son is the same way. We moved here from Lynchburg City. He's been going to Amherst for two years. He was scared. He was afraid that the kids at Amherst wouldn't care about their studies as much as the kids from Lynchburg. He was wrong. The classes he enjoys are the ones where the kids work. They treat each other respectfully. I was that parent that opted my child out. And when I talked to my child and I said, does it bother you that I'm going to opt you out? He says, no, why should it? I'm not going to treat anybody differently. I can think for myself. I can read the materials. No one needs to tell me how to think. I'm like, well, do you feel like you need to talk to somebody else or treat somebody differently because of their color? Nope. What about their sexual identity? Nope. That's what school is about. That's what we need to be teaching our kids. What to learn, not how to treat people. That, that happens at home. That's what I teach my kids at home. Don't worry about what people think of you. Now you're being told people think of you because of your color. My child, my children, they want to learn school, math, math, band, or what everything I hear about. That's what they want to learn. This whole politics thing, if parents have to come up here and debate whether they need to learn it or not, that should be at home. My teachers need to teach them how to get the calculus. They need to teach them that scales and band are more important on your technique than just having fun with it sometimes. The hard work is you have to put into it. And you will get out what you put into it. I don't care your race, your gender, whatever. You will get out of whatever you try as long as you put into that work. And that's it. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to address the board? Hello everyone, I'm Sabrina Kennan, 1805 Winesap Road. I do not have kids in school because I don't have children. Um, this is important to me because I've heard comments about taxpayer money, and that's true. I do care what happens with our children. It is every child every day. That is what you live for. That's what you do. Um, I'm very thankful that the lady just spoke that your kids have that kind of home life, that they have that structure. Um, I've taught college for many years, and I've traveled the country teaching. Not every child has that. So, yes, they have to be exposed to different things. <clears throat> the school board is elected. They went through their process to get this done. And for me, seeing our students, particularly later in life when they come in, 
they just don't all have the same background. They don't all have the same level of support that your child, that your child has. I was raised in a home where I had that. I, I had that structure, I had that guidance. Cousins, neighbors, not so much. So while we all lived in the same community, we served in the same community, and we worshiped and played in the same community, we were not the same and we were not treated the same. I don't want to be that person who's not empathetic to what's going on around me because it hasn't happened to me. I want our kids to be better, and we can't do that if we can't have an open and honest conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gloria Witt. I'm the president of the NAACP Amherst Branch, and uh, I want to applaud the board for allowing us this opportunity. Um, I've got just several observations to make. The first observation I'll make is the three-minute rule. Uh, I recall at the last board meeting, the three-minute rule was not applied. People ran it on for eight minutes. It appears when people of color is showing up, the three-minute rule might be applied. Don't know. Just making an observation. Uh, I also want to go on record with this time change information. I want to. I want it to be known that the board uh, disappointed. NAACP greatly when you reneged on your promise to hold this meeting at 6 p.m. so that you could create equity for working parents to get here on time. You promised it would be at 6, you dropped the ball on communications, and suddenly you had it at 5. I want that noted. The third thing I want to note is this curiosity question, and it's been mentioned by some of you. Uh, th this conversation about equity lessons, uh, it's, it's curious to me that the same talking points that little old Amherst County is having is popping up in Loudoun County, in Maryland, and everywhere. It makes me wonder, is there an underground communication thing happening? along the lines of fear. It's indoctrination. It's making me uncomfortable. You're interrupting my family values. In fact, you're pitting my children against me. Uh, it's uh, uh, the interpretation. Anybody in here, Google it. Look at the definitions of equity and social justice. It's not that darn scary. And finally, Critical race theory. How many times does Dr. Arnold have to tell you this lesson has nothing to do with critical race theory? There is no Santa Claus. Accept it. And finally, has anybody in this room even thought about the other side of the story? And how you, you telling me how your child feel as a white child? Have you, any of you thought about how black and brown children feel when we're having this conversation? And if anybody don't accept the fact these pathetic 25 biased questions are not disparaging and disgusting, just on the face of bias, give me a break. I don't know any business would want to bring their business in Amherst County. Because you're screaming bias. You're screaming it. So from an economic development perspective, good luck, Dean, because we're on TV. Yes. My call to action for our board is this, and the citizenry. All of you are watching this, and you don't like what your board is doing, there's two seats open, District 2 and District 5. Look it up. Turn it over. Get your seat. Get your voice at the table. The school board, Thank you, you need to support Dr. Arnold. You're hired him to drive equity. He's doing it, and all you're doing is driving him in the ground. Thank and you. finally, get used to being uncomfortable we need because we are not stopping. We 123 Aaron Drive, Madison okay, Heights, Virginia. Ms. Witt. <laughs> Ms. Witt, I need you to come back and state your address for the record, please. Did I miss it? I couldn't hear it. My 123 Aaron Drive, Madison Heights, Virginia. Thank Gloria you. T. Witt. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. My name is Laurel Knopp. I'm 823 Union Hill Road, Amherst, Virginia. 
and I am a teacher at Amherst County High School. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background from this past year. The first time I was caught off guard was at the beginning of the school year. We'd been put into teams according to grade level in an effort to coordinate what we taught, and I was excited to share the novel Cry the Beloved Country with the newcomers straight out of college. However, I was quite taken aback when she responded she would never teach a novel by a white man. I tried to find other material, find some common ground. Well, that didn't happen. Unfortunately, white fragility and reparations were not common ground. She stopped talking to me, and after that, she told the principal I intimidated her, and that's why she couldn't work with me. Not long after that incident, I signed up to be a part of the school improvement team, and that was going to have a new vision for the school. We met September 10th at 3 o'clock for the first time, six people in attendance. One of the first things the principal did was to look at me and ask if we, as a faculty, had ever been taught how to teach black children. He then said that Holly Jennings was going to be doing professional development with us, coming into the school and teaching us how to teach black children. Then in November, a colleague came to me asking if I had received an email, a bonus. Well, I went to her computer, I looked at her screen, the writing thanked her for doing the same job that I've been doing during COVID, ironically. And ironically, so had her husband who worked for us, but he didn't get the email or the bonus. And when I asked, I was told it was for downloading lesson plans into, into Canvas, but several of the recipients didn't have Canvas. Some people who got the money didn't even create lesson plans, and many who did create lesson plans got nothing. And this came at a time when surrounding counties extended a $1,000 bonus to all of their employees. Needless to say, our custodians and our cafeteria workers who never worked harder didn't get anything either. Then, December 10th, we received an email marked urgent. When we arrived at school, there was a flurry of activity. Administrators walking the halls telling us, make sure every student downloaded these lessons. These were direct orders from central office. They would be back to make sure every student had downloaded this material. The cover page had a disclaimer. I have to say, I've never seen lesson plans with a disclaimer for a cover page. Stop. Do not go any further without permission. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to leave you hanging. <laughs> My name is Paul Campbell. I live at 116 Mulberry Lane, Monroe. And I want to thank you all for the time to come up here and just say a couple things. Um, first of all, I mean, just I'll bring us a little closer. How's that? <laughs> so first of all, uh, one of the things I want to bring up is, I mean, we're, we're hearing buzzwords like crazy, whether it's equity or social justice. Well, there's another one out there, too. It's called cancel culture. And I believe that this indoctrinating stuff, whatever you want to call it, Equity to me doesn't say equality. It says that there's something more to it than just equality. I believe in equality for everyone. I've got no problem with that whatsoever. But it's my job to teach my kids things at home, how to be a good person, how to live their life. School's job is to go ahead and teach them, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic. And then, of course, now it's got so complicated, I can't even keep up with half of their homework. But um, I'll say this. Our kids went to Lynchburg schools for a while, and they went to the inner city schools. We had no problem with this. That's where the gifted programs were. They were being indoctrinated there. They were being taught that they couldn't just be white and be happy about it. They needed to be questioning their sexuality. They needed to find what made them different, made them a minority themselves. So at the ripe age of 11 years old, our children were coming home from pain. And uh, I forgot the other school that they went to. But anyway, they're coming at 11 years old saying, well, I guess i got to be gay so that I can be accepted. What? So here's 
my biggest concern about teaching this stuff in the schools. I don't believe the teachers are qualified to teach a psychoeducational program such as this. A history teacher? Fine. I understand everybody goes through their socio soci uh, psychological courses and stuff like that, but the level that we're talking right now, I mean, it'd be easy to have this manipulated into basically wiping out a whole culture, cancel culture, just based on people's perceptions and not doing it with the proper foresight, looking into it. I just say leave the bringing the kids up to the parents. Get back to teaching. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to address the board? Hello. Hi, my name is Don Justice. I live at 125 Garland Avenue in Amherst, Virginia. I have eight kids. I've graduated three and I have six more in process. <laughs> we moved here um, last September from the Pacific Northwest and you might wonder why am I up here talking when I just moved here. We left the Pacific Northwest because businesses were being destroyed, because traditional family values were no longer tolerated. They were ridiculed. We learned about, we had seen the Black Lives Matter signs for years, and we were like, yeah, we agree, Black Lives Matter. What we couldn't understand is why what was being done in the name of Black Lives Matter was throwing things at police, was destroying Starbucks, was throwing things at our firemen. I was graffiti on the, the roads. So, so that's why I'm up here, because critical race theory started probably 10 years ago in our school system. If you want to know where this is heading, look at Oregon, California, and Washington State. Our governor just decreed that CRT is to be taught in all schools. According to the critical race theory, it is an academic framework that defines racism not as an individual action or choice, but as racism that is imbued into a system, through a legal system, through an educational system, through a medical system. And that is why they define people based as oppressor or oppressed by skin color, because they don't see it as unique individual um, characteristic. It's racist to say people of color are incapable of rising above in our current situation. When I was reading through the Virginia Department of Education's program, they focused a lot on discipline and that the um, requirements for behavior were inequitable. They were not able for children of color to rise up to that. And I'm like, that's just baloney. How could you ever tell a child that? When I went to school, I was taught, you're a human being first. Where you want to go is where you can go. It doesn't matter where you came from. That's the beauty of the American system, that all people are created equal, that all people are endowed with their certain inalienable rights by their creator because we're image bearers. And critical race goes completely against that. So I'm up here because I love this town. When I came into this town, I met everyone. Well, not everyone, obviously, because there's a lot of you that don't know me. But I went to the coffee shops. I went to the Hills Hardware. I went to the Baptist Church coffee place. I met Carl at the coffee place on down, in downtown. I, anyways, I love this town, and I love its racial diversity. I don't want to see it change. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Anyone else? I have a, a letter that was sent to me. Okay. Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Is it on? Mm-hmm. Okay. You have one more. Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm? Hello. Hello, my name is Eric Rossi. I live at 244 Todd Lane. Uh, I have prepared a statement. I'm... Uh, 
not really good at public speaking and get very, very nervous. I was wondering if I could get a few extra minutes to read my <laughs> statement. Everybody gets three minutes. We're being fair. <laughs> so you, you don't support the equity. Is, is that what I'm saying? <laughs> is that what I'm hearing? Equity doesn't apply here? I'm sorry? That's all. That's all I have. Thank you. Ms. Ligon, I believe you have a letter. Oh, sorry. So, sorry. My name is Lauren Kirshner. I live in Lynchburg and I work in Amherst County. Um, I'm a white female and I'm scared. I am uncomfortable. I am uncomfortable with what I've heard this evening. And I want you to know that I'm up here anyway because I have privilege. I recognize it. And I want you to know that I work for all students. What I want to see is we all need to do a little bit more work on ourselves. Okay? I teach empathy. I've heard that word one other time this evening. One. If you are uncomfortable with what I am saying right now, Please do some work. Thank you. It is rather chilly. Oh, God, it is. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh -huh. My name is Beverly Jones. I live at 682 Amalon Road, Madison Heights, Virginia. I taught in Amherst County Public Schools for 40 years. Some of my students are here tonight. I still love them, I still hug them. But our point here tonight is, we have taken an equity lesson, a lesson on media bias, and turned it into, I can't even find the words to describe it. We done gone to Marxism, we done gone to CRT, we done gone to this and that, and it had nothing to do with it. But in my soul, I know exactly where this is coming from. And it is political. You can hate me, you can call me names, I don't care, but I'm gonna speak this. This is the Republican playbook, word for word, that is coming from all over the United States based on documents and articles that you never even heard of. A lady got up and read something about this and that. I wanted to know, where does the information come from? You never heard that. But you hear the lies and the misinterpretations of everything. And being a teacher, loving my county, loving my school system, and teaching my heart out, no kid ever called me a name. I never called a student a name. We worked together and we were awesome. And look at what you are doing to this school system. People on the school board, you bring up things to bring in negativity. Then you expect everybody to fall on their knees and worship you. You done brought in God. You done brought in Martin Luther King. Who else you gonna bring in? It's ridiculous, these things that are going on that is destroying a perfect school system that was trying to do the right thing. Equity, treat all students right. We all do that, that's what teachers do. I feel like there's some undercurrents. High school teachers, I feel there's some undercurrents. Instead of sitting down discussing these things, you throw them out here. And where does that leave us? Wowing. So as a teacher with 40 years under my belt, we need to get this right. And we need to teach equity. We need to teach all these. Nobody's indoctrinating you as a child. With what? We're teaching. But you don't let us teach. You don't want to say this, don't want to do that. Get over it. Come together. Stop spreading lies and misinformation. Because I love Elmas County Public School, and that's why I gave it my life. Thank you. Vance Wilkins, 299 East Monitor Road. I was not going to speak until I 
got triggered here by calling the Republican part of this thing lies. That's, that's not civil conversation. We should talk to, I'd like to meet with you and say I'm talk to everybody in this room who wants to do it and discuss it because what we have right here, the first thing we have is a definition. Equity. Giving each student what they need to be successful. That's not the definition of equity you would probably find in the dictionary. The definition of equity in some corners, and it depends on which definition you use, what you're talking about. We talk right past each other because you have one definition of equity, I may have another. Is, is this the definition of equity, equity you're talking about? We can agree on that. But what we talk about with equity and some of the things, and it is political for sure, and it starts on the left. <laughs> the, no. Well, what they are saying that you have to have equity of outcomes, e equal outcomes based on race. That's what equity is in some people on the political term. Why is some school divisions doing away with accelerated math and teaching math to the students and having a high grades in competition? They're talking about because the African American didn't have as high scores on math as the whites did. So, uh, wait, let me finish, let me finish. Because that, that is what they do in some places. Now, I know it's true in some places. But what nobody tells you in history books, we just came out just here later, we found out that there were four women, before we had computers, that did the ma mathematical calculations to take a ship to the moon and back, and all four of those were black women. So anybody that says that the black folks can't learn math or can't do good in math and we ought to change math because they can't do it, is a racist. And that's what they're putting out. And so I'd love to have conversations with anybody here. Barbara? Where's Barbara? Barbara Pryor was one of my opponents in an election one time, and she's the most honest politician I've ever met. And we don't agree on anything, hardly, but we can talk. No, we can talk, though, and talk to each other. And, and she has her things that she believes in, and I have things I believe in. But, but we can talk. And anybody who, who wants to have a different idea about this, call me. And I'd love to talk with you because I have, I have some strong feelings about it, too. And, and if, we, if we dumb down the math on some pretext, whatever it is, the Chinese are not doing it, the Russians are not doing it, and we're going to fall behind militarily, and we're going to lose this country. So we need that every kid at every level do the best they can do in every subject so that we can produce more and, and do better than the people who are trying to bury us, the Chinese communists and the Russians. Thank you all so much. know me because I live in this town. I work for the town. And my name is, can you yeah, just pull it down? Yeah. Okay. My name is Marie Davis Woodson. I've been in this town forever. I'm 71 years old. And I, I have been listening to, outside, listening to some of this stuff and it hurts my heart because first of all, I'm a black woman and I lived in this town in the, in the 50s and the 60s when they still had colored on their walls and they had fountains that we couldn't drink out of. Now, bringing it forward to the day, I have a 16-year-old granddaughter. Forgive me if I cry, but I have a 16-year-old granddaughter that was adopted by my single parent daughter. We have raised her since she was two weeks old. We don't know what race she is. Her mother, her biological mother, said that her father was black and she's white. My granddaughter looks white. Blonde hair, hazel eyes, everything. But she's being raised by a black family, which is kind of different. She's had a hard life. People used to come up and ask us if she's all right. If she's all right, we are her parents. And I'm shaking because this is what she's had to go through for 16 years. She's been walking around in the world not really knowing what race, but she loves everybody. But she gets from her white friends, you know, because your parents are black. Are you scared of your papa? Because my husband is black. She gets scared. She gets asked, are you scared of black men? 
Then the white, the black kids don't really want to be her friend because she's too white. She's very smart. She's a gifted, you know, she's in the uh, advanced study. She's doing really good. She's as precious to me. She's more precious to me than my biological grandchildren because she's been with me ever since. But I wish you knew. I wish you knew what she has to go through every day. And I was standing outside and I was listening to all this and I was saying, you know, she can't take on the world by herself. She can't tell her white friends that black people are all right. That there's nothing wrong with us. That we just want to be equal. That we just want to be the same. That, we, that she shouldn't have, some, have somebody come up to her and say to her, are you afraid of them? Do they hurt you? Who does that? Who does it? Somebody's kid who was at home being taught that black people are bad. So that's why we need to make things so that they will know the difference. That everybody knows that people's skin color does not make them bad. White people are bad. Black people are bad. Everybody. You know, there's bad, bad in everybody. But this child, and I'm sure many other children who are biracial, or even many other kids who have black friends go through hell, excuse me, for just wanting to be equal, want people to be the same. She, she does it, I hear you talking about who people who are gay, people who are, she understands all that. And I, I'm a Christian, I go to church every Sunday, I sing on my church choir, I do. You know what the Bible tells me? Is that I don't have to like the sin, but I have to love the person. And that's all I got. Miss Marie. <laughs> Can you come back for just a second? I don't, I don't think we got your address. Oh. <laughs> Do I have to tell him? <laughs> <laughs> my husband's probably going to kill me. <laughs> um, um, what do you want, my street address? Mm -hmm. 196 Depot Street. 196. Thank you. Right. Sorry. Hello. My name is John Hoff. I live at 325 Spring Garden Road. And um, I'd like to thank the board, both boards, for having people here tonight and listening to everybody. And I did a lot of research on what y'all were teaching, the um, equity training. I looked at the um, curriculum and all that, and I'm a conservative. I didn't see really see a problem with the equity class. Now, as the other stuff is getting thrown in, the critical race theory, I can't say I agree with, but the equity thing, I mean, that can be related to things going on today. The riots out in the middle, um, in like Portland and Oregon and all that, the same thing. The media kind of shows one side of the story. And I really didn't have a problem with that part. But there are some things coming up with, I know this whole thing started with um, referrals, it, it said, um, student referrals. And I know I watched some of the board, school board meetings and they were talking about the African American students on and the um, advanced classes as much. Well, you have to be careful, I, and I stress to the school board, you have to be careful when, especially when certain groups are pushing things. If you want to be equal, do they really want to be equal or do they want special treatment? Ask yourself that when you make a decision. I mean, I'm fine with treating everybody fairly. I don't have a problem. That's what I try to do in life, treat everybody fair. But there's a whole lot of groups out here that are asking for special treatment. And I see those groups on some of y'all's committees. I see those groups speak at every meeting. Just at, whenever you make a decision, ask yourself, are we really being fair? Or are we giving somebody special treatment? Are we changing the rules so this group thrives? We shouldn't be doing that. And as far as my white privilege, anybody's welcome to come to work with me and spend a day with my white privilege. <laughs> I mean, I think just throwing the term white in front of anything. It's just as racist as me throwing the term black in front of anybody. I mean, I hate to be disrespectful to anybody, but 
I mean, this is the 2000s. Come on. It, it, the 60s? Some of this is relevant. I don't buy into white privilege. I'll say that to the news. I'll say it to everybody in there. It's a gimmick. It's a buzzword. That's really all I got to say. Y'all have a nice day. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to address the board? I'm going. <laughs> Hello. Hi. My name is Sid Storosen, 362 Peters Hollow Road, Monroe. Um, I've changed what I want to say about 75 times since it began. So much has been said. Uh, many very helpful comments helping us understand where people are coming from. I do want to start out by saying that I have privilege, and the greatest privilege I have is being a citizen of the United States. This country, this country was forged under the motto E Pluribus Unum, from the many, one. Uh, it's been a struggle. We started out with a, with a uh, slave state, essentially. We made it past the Civil War, got through Jim Crow, and I'm a child of the 1960s. I remember the Civil Rights Movement very well. I demonstrated in the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and I can tell you, having been there, we've come a long, long way in this country. And to throw it away with divisive material, learning material that's coming down from Richmond and Washington, D.C., and it is not Republican in origin, I'm sorry. It's really, not a, it's really not a partisan matter. It's just you have to look at the content and you will know that this is not appropriate material for our children to be studying. I looked at the, some of the sources that Dr. Arnold listed. I assume you, you're the one who provided them. The um, learningforjustice.org is a horrible site. The first thing I saw on there when I opened up their home page was a, a vicious anti-Israel propaganda piece. Has no place in children's education. Um, there is no better place in the world to be a black person a Jew, a Hispanic, an Arab than the United States of America. I don't think anybody wants to go to any other place. And I believe that much of the, much of the material that's being handed down to us and being adopted by our school board indiscriminately, and maybe with the best of intentions, I don't, I don't pin bad intentions on anyone, uh, but I believe it's, it's very harmful material. The fact that it's so-called evidence-based or researched is meaningless. I'm in the scientific community. Those terms are used all the time to justify pure garbage. Scientific research is completely untrustworthy. Medical research is completely untrustworthy to a large extent. Uh, and these terms mean that just somebody did a little research, somebody had some evidence. You go into court, both sides have evidence. They're not both right. Um, and the question of equity, Equity, I also have a law degree, and I'm not bragging about it. I just simply want to point out that equity does have a very specific meaning in the law and in general usage. The definition that you provided is, will not be found in the dictionary. Equity is an individual treatment of people uh, based on, on fairness and impartiality. Impartiality is key and individuality is key. We don't treat people based on group categories. We treat people individually under the law, and I think it's a good lesson to carry into life in general. As Martin Luther King said, and God forbid we mention Martin Luther King, um, judge people by the content of their character, not by their color. His goal, and I believe it's a worthy goal, is to have a colorblind Thank society, you, and it's very much in evidence, or very was you, very much in evidence up until a few years ago when this Thank material you. seeped in. And Thank you very much for your time. Anybody else wishing to address the board? All right, yeah. at this time we're going to turn it over for your letter, Ms. Ligon. Yeah, I have a letter and then I'll do my comments. Uh, Mr. Roger, you want to read your letters first? Go, go ahead. You sure? Okay. All right. Um, I received a letter by email and it was asked for me to read it tonight. I'm going to be obedient. Uh, she said that I'm unable to be at the meeting. Could you please share this at the meeting and read it in my absence? Dear members of the school board, this past year has come with obvious challenges. Having friends that work in various areas of Amherst County school system, I've heard the frustration and the joy that these challenges have brought. One thing that you can always say about the citizens of Amherst County is that they show up for our kids. They are at the sports events, they are at the plays and the choral performances, and they show up for academic uh, events. Amherst County Citizens supports the children in this community. 
I was excited when I heard that the equity lessons were going to be included in this year. I've heard, uh, I've heard mumbling that there were parents and teachers that were unhappy about these lessons. I went to the website and reviewed the lessons, and I'm still unclear what the issue would be with these lessons. Unfortunately, we are all biased whether we want to recognize this or not. When we know better, we can do better. Most of us try to live by the golden rule of treating others how we want to be treated by understanding that others' experience is not the same as yours and you can better understand others' point of view. I do not feel that this is a burden but a gift to, each, to teach our children. At a young age, they can understand we come from different places and experiences. Many companies are including equity and inclusion training for their employees. Kudos to Amos County for beginning this at a young age. It is exciting to live in a community that values us all and has taken this step to provide these tools for our children. Being a good neighbor is not liberal or conservative. It is being a good neighbor. It is wanting better for our community and the people that live in it. It is learning and growing individually and as a community. Let's not politicize an issue that is neither left or right. Be proud that we live in a community that cares about us all. Sincerely, Cindy Hunter. Yes, sir. Okay. I just want to say I'm time of the needs for three minutes as well to make it fair throughout the thing. Okay, I have I have two letters. Okay. This one is from S Sam Sogar. Sogar. Sogor. Um, dear Amherst County Board of Supervisors, please make sure school faculty administrators get paid. As of now, the teachers do not have their contracts for September. I am grateful to the schools for their efforts to teach perspective. Please approve the school budget so that the educators get paid, and also please stop making their jobs harder than they already are. Amherst County Public Schools has done a great job this year. They deserve our gratitude and respect and to get paid. Let's make sure Amherst retains and continues to attract talented employees. The students' academic futures hang in the balance, for goodness sake. You must not mess with the funding. Sincerely, Sam Sogar, Town of Amherst, candidate for Virginia House of Delegates, 24th District. <laughs> I have another letter here. This one is from Carrie Forbes. Good evening. My name is Carrie Forbes, and I reside at 202 Oak Ridge Drive in Madison Heights. Thank you for the opportunity to share. I apologize as prior business appointments prevent me from appearing in person, but as this is such a crucial moment, I cho chose to send my thoughts. In mythology, the Trojan horse was a gift to the city of Troy from the warring Greeks. The people of Troy accepted this gift, and it led to their downfall, as inside were warriors waiting for the opportunity to destroy the city. In Amherst County, we are now deciding about our own version of the Trojan horse, critical race theory. I admit to being late to the ball game in regards to this destructive ideology, but hope to share what I have learned. Critical race theory has, or CRT, has destructive beginnings. CRT traces its roots back to the Marxist concepts of conflict theory. It continues through the teachings of Antonio Gramsci of hegemony and the oppressor-oppressed battle. Mix in a little liberation theology and you have the recipe for CRT. CRT has destructive beliefs. At least three of the core principles of CRT are the following. One, racism is normal. Robin DeAngelo in her book, White Fragility, posits that when looking at a situation, one need not ask if racism occurred, but rather how racism presented. Two, convergence theory. Richard Delgado in his book, Critical Race Theory, suggests that white people are incapable of righteous acts in regards to racism, unless it converges with their own self-interest. Three, knowledge and truth is a social construct. There are no absolute truths. As we have convert conversations about our experiences, we develop truth. A quick trip to the Virginia Department of Education website reads like a who's who of radical CRT apologists. CRT has a destructive end goal. Ibram X. Kendi, a leading voice of CRT and author of the popular book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, has gone so far as to propose an amendment to the Constitution to form a Department of Anti-Racism. The goal of this new, new fully funded department would be to pursue and punish any national, state, or local policy it deems to be racist, with the full backing of the U.S. government. How does any of this apply to Amherst County and the current issues at hand? 
The equity lesson is classic CRT, even though it has been sold much differently. It was sold as a lesson in, quote, critical thinking in the specific arena of media bias. Everything about this lesson from the event mentioned, Greensboro Massacre, to the essential questions, can the truth ever be fully known, to the first point under establish and define norms, which explains to students that you Explain to students you will be discussing a sensitive topic in the area of social justice. To every question under the summary and assessment section. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I would just like to make a couple of comments. Um, first of all, uh, I'm shivering because I'm freezing in here. I'm not shivering because I'm scared. Um, I, I received a call or an email from WSET and I declined comment. I received some other comments uh, to come and talk. And I didn't want to do that because I'm not that type of person. I, I think some of you in here know me. Those who don't know me, let me just get it straight who I am. I'm a realist and, and I'm not a racist and I don't see color. Let me just throw that out there first. Uh, I feel like the superintendent and, and myself, I can only speak because I'm talking, is on defense tonight. Uh, because there's been a misinterpretation of, of a lesson that went out. I got caught off guard because I didn't know anything about this nightmare, to be honest. Maybe I've been in a cave, but I knew what we were teaching. I knew why we were teaching. I've been to several equity classes uh, in Richmond before the COVID. I've been to Upward Poverty. I've been to Achievement Gaps with five superintendents. I've been watching this for a minute. And then all of a sudden it came down, as some have said, we don't need to do what the government says. I'm okay with that concept, if you would like to say that. But I'm also knowing that we, we brought a man here to Amherst two years ago uh, with the public comment that said, bring him on in, he's going to take Amherst County to great places. In his roadmap, which he uses, a little car, equity was one of those things that we were talking about. I didn't say that he defined it. He did not, he's a PhD man. He did not define equity on this piece of paper of what equity is for everyone. He was defining it as what Amos County is looking for. The intention of these classes, I said the intention, I realize now, and I realize in the last few weeks that it's gotten totally carried away. The real intention was just to get ahead of the game of what is going to be happening in my workplace, and I have several. We're all talking about equity, inclusion, and diversity. Everybody. Every class that we go to, are you culturally competent to teach the students that I teach? Can you teach all students the same? I'm telling you right now, I had some tears, and I'm old, but I had some tears when I read number 20. Number 20 says, are there differences in the ways in which white children are taught differently than children of color? Who in the world would ask that type of question to anyone on this board. I know Ligon can answer that, absolutely not. I know Dr. Arnold can answer that, absolutely not. The administration in Amherst County is not trying to teach anybody different from another, one from another. Now, let us speak about this. Someone brought up about changing things to suit other people. Equality in classes has to be looked at. When OCR came in this area, I was on the board, and they, they kind of slapped us on the tail. Okay, let's write that down. They said, listen, you're not doing fairness in Amherst County. We have discipline problems. We have nobody on golden A's. We have nobody on this, that, and the other. We need for you to straighten your act up. And I got on a working committee with Dr. Wells and Dr. Jennings and some other civic leaders in this community, and we said, what can we do that everybody is on the same playing field. Now, maybe you don't want to hear that, but that's just the way it is. And so everything that has been happening since then is saying we don't want to get caught again with our pants down. I don't care what the color of your skin is. Anybody in this room that knows me, I could care less about the color of your skin, but I need to, for you to understand, and let me be clear, for Ms. Ligon, every child, every day, We'll try to get the best education. That's why I'm on the board for 21 years. I'm not doing it. I'm getting a free parking space for football. Hello. <laughs> but I'm really here because I care about folks. I raise my own children here. They love me. I love them. We love anybody of color. But I will not defend things that are wrong. These lessons were intended. I said intended to help this community. 
When you grow older and you go into the workforce and you don't know who you're working beside, you don't know who your brothers and sisters are, you don't know how to treat them, they ask you, where'd you come from? Dr. Arnold was trying to get ahead of that and say, we want to prepare our young people to know who you are and what struggles you've had. We don't need to go back to the 60s. I'm not even rehearsing that right now. But let me be clear about this. I grew up here. I was educated here, and I'm happy here. I'm still here. But I know with some things that have happened here. I'm not need to go there right now, but thank God I've overcome them. My children overcome them. I feel good about it. I'm not going to defend what we did here. If we made a mistake, I said if we made a mistake in the intention, and the intention got blew away, all someone had to do, no one has called me yet. I got two phones. One landline and one cell. No parent has called and said, Ms. Ligon, what you doing? I would have said, come, come talk to me. Come have lunch with me. No parent has, the, the way this should have been, I wanted to look into this English situation right away. Because if a teacher said that, Dr. Hall said, I just, when I reached over like this, he said, I don't know anything about it. Okay, we're going to follow up. We're not going to try to discriminate within our own school system. We're not going to make anybody feel bad, someone using the word, I'm frightened, I'm scared. I'm not afraid nor scared. We are grown-ups in here. And we're trying to keep our children grown-ups. They will get in the world one day. They will ask questions one day. I'm 65 years old, and a bus went by me on tempers that I couldn't get on. But I didn't get angry, and my parents did not teach me to get angry. They, they did teach me, and the schools taught me at that particular time what was going on, and I'm a better person because I understood it. I didn't hold grudges. When I couldn't get my arm vaccinated at the health department because I went in the wrong door, nobody got mad. I'm still good. I still love you because I was not taught that. We are trying, he is trying to teach your children the same thing. Maybe it went the wrong way. You know how things are titanic. You should have turned a little sooner. Maybe we turned, we didn't turn this thing soon enough. And I understand everyone's conversation. So don't email me what you mean. This I hear you. And this is nothing new because people are going to have different ideas. I can say something and you can say something. And another person can say something and it will change. Three of the most complicated subjects, I'm almost through, don't even time me. Three of the most complicated <laughs> subjects is sexuality, political affiliation, and race. You want to quiet the room down and you start talking. You got to, hey, I'll talk with you. I won't be privileged. I don't even like that word. I don't know who started it. And I won't be black. I'm just going to be ligging. I'll have that conversation with you. So if we offended people, I've been knowing Mr. Wilkins all my life. My children, his children roll my bus. Come on now. I don't need to talk about political stuff. You keep saying we're not talking about it, and then we start talking about it. I got grandchildren in this system. See, they're talking to me right now. Mama, be quiet. I got grandchildren in the system. I want them to thrive in Amherst County. I want to keep living here a little while longer. In the work that I do as I close, in the work that I do, I, I said this one time at a school meeting, y'all heard me. I don't, I treat people, I x-ray everybody. They come in, toe up from the flow up. Drunk, belligerent, black, white, Indian, Latino, gay, not gay. I still got to x-ray them because I took an oath. The same oath I took on the school board. My time's almost up. I'm talking about, I'm just about through giving the chairmanship up. But let me tell you, before I do it, let's straighten things out. People are all over the neighborhood. I used to go to Richmond and say, we got a good relationship with the Board of Supervisors. They said, what? I said, yes, indeed. And God knows the same person called me the other day and said, what's going on in Amherst? I said, listen, I can't talk right now. I can't talk to you right now because I don't even know. We want to continue that. People saying all kinds of stuff. They're keeping your money. Hello. I appreciate you all wanting to get to the bottom of things. Taxpayers want to know. But the money, the budget, is for everybody. So them yellow buses can run. 
so food can be served, so teachers can get paid. That has nothing to do with a miscommunication. As I close, that number 20 about killed me. I was crying. I called a board member. He knows I did. He didn't say who he was. I said, man, what in the world? And so everybody said, the chair is not saying nothing. She's a cat. The chair has just been listening and praying. That's what the chair has been doing. Because I've never seen such a situation. But I'm not too smart or too dumb to get in here and handle it. We're going to handle this English thing. I don't know what's happened. Doesn't sound right. We don't want people. Dean don't want everybody to leave the county. Do you? No. Nope. <laughs> I'm just checking. More. You know how folks are. I can't. Don't think the grass is any green on the other side. Just stay right here and hang in here with us. But you've got to call the proper people. If anybody had called me, we could have talked about this. And I don't know about the changes of time. One minute was five, one minute was six. You and I talk, you and them talk. I just came on over. We do the best we can. i tell you one thing I will not do. As I, I'm through now, you can start that thing. I will not divide my life by black and white. Not me. Thank you. You know I can't be quiet now. <laughs> uh, Ms. Legan and I are two of the oldest board members have been consistent here. So we're really two old battle axes. I don't know about and, <laughs> I don't know about all that. But um, I started getting a lot of questions about this, and so I would write the questions down, and I would talk to my board members. And so I just want to clarify the record here. Mr. Rogers did not come up with these questions. They came from people in the community that sent them to me and other board members. He's a much better writer than I am. He wrote them all down. He sent them to Dr. Arnold. Rather than be quiet, wouldn't you rather know what people are asking? I would. And they're, they're painful questions. Some of them are not nice questions. But we need to hear them so we can fix what's wrong here. If you don't talk about it, it's a cancer. And we've got to talk about it. And I feel much better now that everything's out in the open, that we're going to get a path forward. I want to say this right in the beginning, and I didn't do it, but I want to thank all the teachers, the administration, the school board, the ladies and the men in the cafeteria, the bus drivers. Nobody had a manual on how to operate in a pandemic. But daggone it, we all got through it. We got through it, and I think that we're going to be better on the other side. So for everybody here that did this, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our heart. Um, Let's see. The last thing I wanted to say was uh, the only one, I had one question when all this started. I said, Dr. Arnold, you know, what is required from the Commonwealth of Virginia and what do we have flexibility on? I think we may have flexibility on more than what we, we thought. But anyway, I couldn't do what you all do as a parent of kids who have been through this for the last year. I certainly couldn't do what you teachers are doing. And I just thank you from the bottom of my heart. And we will get through this. So at this point in time, I'm going to open the floor for anybody on the school board, board of supervisors that want to speak. Mr. Wright? I hope we're not held to the three minutes. No. <laughs> Is this on? Pull the thing forward. Okay. I have a lot to say. So I just found, need to find all my notes. Who are you? Um, <laughs> I am Amanda Wright. I represent District 2 on the school board. So um, I'm going to start out <coughs> explaining that I guess that I've had a foot on both sides of the fences as far as the civil rights movement goes. I was born after the civil rights movement, so I didn't live through any of those type things. And I grew up in a time when it was taking root and things were changing and, um, you know, 80s and 90s sort of thing. But I knew enough growing up about race issues and whatnot that I knew I wanted to do better. And no one may care about my lived experience, and that's okay, but I have a little story to share. I have a daughter. Um, this was probably 15 years ago. And we were in another county at a ball field, and um, she saw some 
boys playing, young, this was elementary school, some boys playing ball at the other end of the pavement. And she said, there's my friend X from school. And I was like, oh, well, which one is he? She said, the little, he's the one in the red shirt. And he happened to be the only black boy playing ball with a group of white kids. And in that moment, I was very proud that she pointed him out as the boy in the red shirt. And that made a difference to me as a parent. So that's just one of my lived experiences. But, um, and I'm, I'm kind of emotional about all this stuff. Because I have kids in the school system too. And I live here. But um, I'm going to start out about Dr. Arnold. I don't think we could have had anyone better lead us through COVID. Your leadership strength shined through. And taking care of all students, I saw it was front and foremost. From providing lunches when school was closed to hot spots for internet throughout the county, it didn't matter who you were. Home visits for students falling behind, COVID clinic for those in the community who wanted a vaccine, you rallied for that. And I know that you're always there for every child every day. And I don't think that if we do anything it's ever with the intent to harm. And I don't believe that you meant any harm. Speaking as a board member, why did I let this lesson go through? It's been a question I've been asked. I had some issues with things that I felt weren't impactful as far as the lesson itself was concerned, such as the source. And if we're gonna have a conversation, we're gonna have an honest conversation. And that means having the right information. The source was originally teaching tolerance. After this lesson, after the pause and um, we allowed for, or put in the conditions or whatever, teaching tolerance changed to learning for justice. Teaching tolerance was established in 1991 under the Southern Poverty Law Center. I followed Southern Poverty Law Center for years for different reasons than just education. Some of the things that are on learning for justice website now were not on the teaching tolerance website back in January and February. And it is of a concern. Um, so the source was an issue for me, but the students weren't going to be, you know, seeing the source. Um, I felt that an equity lesson on media bias, you know, I, it was an old um, event that happened in the 70s, but media bias is an important thing to deal with. So um, I honestly, truly didn't think it would have a huge impact one way or the other after I went through the lesson on our students and that's because some of the things I've heard since around the secondary lesson I don't think is giving our students much credit and I believe our students are already here kind of where we're trying to get them to be in Amherst County there's some things to work on but if you just talk to any student I'm always impressed when I go to any event where a student is in charge of something or has a speech to say I'm talking to everybody. I know I'm looking here, but I'm talking to everybody. You'll be amazed if you talk to a student in Amherst County, I think. I think they're better at this than we are. They're already cultivating culturally diverse relationships. They are already having respectful conversations. And I will not sell our students short. Now, we're sitting here as the board having to defend or deny things that maybe we said, maybe we didn't say. Like Ms. Ligon said, if we made a wrong call, then we adjust ship. But as far as um, information goes, it's, it's got to be correct. We've got to have honest information out there. And um, critical race theory, I'm, I agree. It's probably all of the worst things that any of you have said and thought it is. Everybody here has said, even in NAACP, it's not critical race theory, it's not critical race theory. But I'm going to give an example because I love Greek mythology. And if you read anything in Greek mythology, you know about the Hydra. The Hydra is a multi-headed serpentine monster. And if you cut off one head, it grows two more. You can stand up and say all day long you don't teach critical race theory. That's just cutting the head off. It's going to grow two more. To kill the Hydra, you have to cauterize it. Kill it where it begins. You don't like critical race theory. It's already in curriculum. It's already coming in. It's been bleeding in. You have to be diligent as parents. You have to pay attention. Just like Ms. Tolley pointed out hit you. Um, about the, the teacher who said these things about the English teacher. 
And I'm not, I'm glad, not the only one who didn't know. So if these things are creeping in, you have to be the soldiers for us. If you're not telling us, we don't know. And one of the things that was read, I actually had in my notes, um, there's a lot of Trojan horses that allow this coming in. We put, Amherst County puts links on our homepage if you want to go to VDOE to comment on anything they have coming down the pipeline, our links are there. You got to comment on the VDOE stuff because this stuff is coming down the pipeline. I am disheartened to hear public, and this is where I get really bothered, because I believe fully in the family values. We can't teach, I don't believe we should be teaching family values, because that comes from a family. And if things are trampling on family value, I've said it at your board meetings, I've said it in other public forums, I am not a supporter of big government. I don't want the government telling me to do anything. I don't even want to wear my seatbelt. But they tell me i got to wear my seatbelt. I do it so I don't get fined. You know, I don't want to wear a mask. I do it sometimes when I choose to do it. I don't like the government telling me anything. But I am disheartened to hear public statements from leaders outside of the school saying that family values are indoctrination. That family values are lies that are told over and over. I don't think that's fair, and that doesn't allow for an honest, respectful conversation. I do want to correct one thing that was said, that our board made a motion to ban CRT. We didn't make a motion to ban CRT. It was to ban certain components that fall under CRT. Because like I said, you cut off the head, it grows two more. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Is there any other board member wishing to speak, board supervisors, school board? You can pull that microphone there. <laughs> um, I would just... Yeah, make sure it went, yeah. I don't know how to turn it. Switches on top, pull it towards you. Did I do it? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say about that comment um, by uh, Mrs. Knopp. I was informed about that um, between what was said from the English department, and I did report that to Dr. Arnold. I just wanted to put that out there. That was reported. Thank you. Um, Ms. Knopp, what English thing did Ms. Knopp say? Um, about uh, another English teacher stating that they will not teach a book written by okay. a white man. But not the one. That's not the one Ms. Tolly said. Okay, and another comment about that they will not be hiring any more um, white teachers. Okay, I right? That was that. reported. Yeah. Thank you. That's, the whole one. That's not the one we need to find out. Okay. Any further discussion? Yeah, I'd like to say something. It's, it's kind of unusual that uh, administrators like Dr. Arnold and, our, and myself sit on this uh, committee, and we actually hold a vote on the committee. And uh, so we're, we're normally very careful about uh, not getting in front of our boards or anything else. Um, but uh, I've been the county administrator here seven years. I live in the town of Amherst don't have any kids in the school system. I have two law degrees and uh, other college degrees. My wife is an ancient history professor. Um, served in the Air Force for 28 years as a judge advocate. So I both prosecuted and defended on both sides. <clears throat> I'm very familiar with the Constitution. Believe it or not, I keep a copy of it on my, my nightstand. And I often refer to it. Um, and one thing's apparent to me tonight, and that is that we are all in violent agreement that all men are created equal. Everyone in this room has been taught that and shares that as a fundamental belief. In fact, that's why you're in this room tonight. Because you know that your opinions are as good as anybody else's. And that the people who are in charge need to hear that. This is, this is unique in the world, and it's precious. And so I want to commend everyone for your courage. It seems in these times, uh, many of us, uh, our courage fails us. We're afraid to come and speak in public about what seems to be trendy and fatty uh, socially. 
and it is important to, to draw back to fundamental principles. Uh, I, I want to commend the school board for the process of reaching out to parents with the curriculum and the ideas and, and what you were doing, and, and that was fantastic. But I think it's apparent here tonight that you probably only reached at most a third of the county. And so I also want to commend you for changing your process to now make it m wider open. There's a lot of people that pay for education. And they don't begrudge paying for education because they know they're paying for the future. They're paying on the kids. They're paying on the people that will take over for them. And they know that that's worth it. But they're still paying. And they want to have some say-so in that. I uh, have taken the liberty of printing out an attorney general opinion, I hope you don't find it too dull, uh, is from the state of Montana, but I, I found it fascinating as it explained not just what critical race theory is, uh, but why it violates the law, why it's unconstitutional. And it cites all the law in there. So for those of you that want your sources, they're all in there. The books, the court cases, and, and what I hope the school board will get familiar with, because this is written for Montana school boards. And a lot of this, from about page 18 on, where the recommendations are, are directed at school boards. And so as you look at this stuff that's going to come down from on high, uh, I, I, I would ask that you dig in your heels. Yeah. There are a lot of communities some legislatures have already banned this stuff completely and utterly. Uh, others have adopted it completely and utterly. And I think you can see from the, uh, the reaction here today that uh, it is at least undecided in this community, uh, although it tends to be a conservative community here and so probably leans away from critical race theory. And I would think you would be respectful of the nature of that community and dig in your heels and wait till you're told. It's been very, I, I got it clarified right at the beginning. There is nothing, nothing that you can point to that requires these lessons. Don't do it. Don't do it until you're told to do it, and then the fight is not in your lap. The fight will be on high, and these good people will, will take it higher. There are elements of critical race theory in this document, beginning with the very title. Uncovering truth in the face of injustice. Okay, this is not about media bias, because though there's an example in there of a media story, that story is about racial injustice. It's all about race. Otherwise, it wouldn't even mention the color of the people involved. So we're starting with the premise that we're going to teach you what's unfair. And then the essential questions of this lesson are about truth. Can different perspectives of the same event occur? Yes. Can they both be true simultaneously? No. Is the truth defined by facts alone? Yes. Does perception shape the truth? No. It shapes opinion. Can the truth ever be fully known? Yes. Sometimes it's difficult. And most times, nobody has the truth, and you have to wait till you get the facts. That's what the kids need to be taught. When you hold a special lesson on a special topic that everybody's going to go to, it gives it special emphasis. Okay? Now... I think it's great that we emphasize that all men are created equal and needed to be treated equally. We all learn that at home. Everyone in this room learned that from their parents. That's not an issue in this country. What's an issue is dividing us up into groups and looking at and, and having us look at uh, breaking us out into differences. Another problem that I spotted in this, you know, these, now th this, this perception that no one can know truth, that truth is defined by your opinion and my opinion and we're all right, that's not correct. I hope their kids are not being taught that because that is not correct. That is not critical thinking at all. 
and, and that's buried in here. Buried in here also is that we're defining social justice as the equal distribution of wealth. That has never been true and is not even why this uh, country was founded. So I would ask that you go through and you, you, you pull the things out. That's why I gave you the opinion. You can understand what it is. If you don't, it's very clear in there what to look for and what you can pull out as we go forward. And with that, uh, I know that uh, the community has to trust you school board members to uh, get the curriculum right. And, and this, is, this is not about fairness. We all agree on fairness. We all want fairness. It's, it's about not undermining the individual worth of every child of God. And that's what this does. Are there any other board members that wish to speak? Um, I'd like to say something. Okay. Um, everybody has said it so well. I'm not really sure exactly um, where I'm going to go with this, but I would first like to thank everyone for your comments. Um, I've been reminded this week to be thankful, to be thankful for the opportunity that we have before us to be able to come together and to talk and to be respectful of one another and to share because usually when there's a divide, there's some truth somewhere in the middle. And so that's what we need to find, and that's what we need to accomplish. And I think that we are taking our first steps forward. Sometimes the growth pains can be difficult. Um, but I do know that we have um, a diversity lesson that came upon us as a board, and there were some concerns. And the concerns came from teachers, they also came from parents. Um, and as board members, we step up and we try to represent you, the public. And when that concern started to come to us, we felt it would be wise to take a step back and to just think for a few moments, what are we looking at? You know, what's the process, that type thing. Um, but when we did that, we weren't called wise. I do appreciate respectful conversation, and I hope that tonight's respectful conversation can continue because there is work to be done. I so appreciate, Mrs. Legan, for your leadership and your comments tonight. Um, you know, you, showing love and respect for all people and letting you as the citizens know that that's what's at the leadership of our school board. We want to be fair. We want to show um, equality to every student but sometimes those winds come upon us and it's things that we are not even maybe privy to at the time so we start to learn on the sidebar there's stuff coming to us from Richmond there's all of this ideology on critical race theory and yes Dr. Arnold you can say we don't teach that here but it is coming it is on the Virginia Department of Education's website. And that has nothing to do with fairness, that has nothing to do with equity, that has nothing to do with diversity and inclusion. I think the first place we have to start is defining what those words mean so that we have a common language. The first, one of the first things of leadership when you're trying to move an organization is to understand what those words mean. Because we don't want, I don't want, I'm not gonna support an ideology that makes students' identity be found in groups because I agree with Mr. Rogers. Our children's identity is found in God and God alone. And our children have been without education the way it should be, face to face with the teachers for a year and a half. And you know what? They're suffering. They're sitting at home. They're playing video games. They're getting negative input and they need their education. So we need to be focusing on academics. We need to be focusing on those students that need some, some, some emotional support. But not every single one of our students needs it. 
we don't have to do everything the same for everyone. We learn as educators to meet students where they are, to give them the supports that they need to get to their place that they can be successful. And I will continue to support that. But I also know that while with the diversity lesson, we paused, I'm gonna tell you what I found personally. I found that as a division, we were lacking in due process. We had no policy in place that allowed a shared community input or vision or review. So that pause, while some people called us out for that, allowed us to be able to take a moment and evaluate what we were doing. And if we don't give every citizen in Amherst County a voice, we are not doing our job. So Dr. Arnold is working with us on helping to come up with a policy that is similar to some things that we see happening at the state level to where there are opportunities for the curriculum to be developed. If we have a need for a diversity lesson, then we develop that around shared values. That the community sees it, the community can talk about it like we're doing tonight. We come to some common understanding and we move forward. If that's what's right for our children, as many say it is and many believe that it is, then doing it right has got to be the good, common sense, wise thing to do. Not just go do it. So that's what we as a board are trying to do. Now, I believe there's been a whole lot of other conversation that's been mixed up in that, and that comes in with the critical race theory. I personally like to call it critical theory because I think it goes beyond race. When I look at what the Virginia Department of Education is promoting and what they're teaching, it is dividing our students into groups, and it is not what I consider fair and equitable. Now, that's my personal opinion. But I think here in Amherst County, what we're trying to do is we're trying to work on respect. We're trying to work on making sure our students are side by side. I grew up at a time of civil disrest. And I knew at that time we had much growth and much learning to do as a community. And I've seen it. And we've grown. We have a lot further to go. And I want to do it hand in hand with every single person in this county without name calling. I want us to do it because it's what's right for our children. But I want to do it with shared values. And I also want just to make sure we are cognizant of what's coming from Richmond and that we watch that. I haven't heard anybody in this room say they supported CRT, that they supported those ideologies. We do respect family values. We do want to make sure parents have a say about their children's education. And as long as I'm on this board, that's what I'm gonna be fighting for. But I'm also gonna be fighting for every single one of those students because every child every day does matter. And as an educator, that's what I've lived by. I want to say that Mrs. Gross, I so appreciate your conversation with me tonight. Your respectfulness in your approach made me want to listen to you and learn more. I would love to sit down and talk with you. Respect goes a long way and that meant much to me. Um, but I know we have a lot of work to do. When I heard Mrs. Tolley talk about the lesson that was in her class, that was appalling to me. I'm sorry. If I'm on this board, I mean, y'all can kick me off. I won't ever permit a lesson like that if I have any say-so about it. So there is work to be done, and there are places that we need to work, but we can't see everything. We have to have a commitment together, the board, the school board, the teachers, the parents, the board of supervisors. We have to commit together to work on this because it's a lot. We can't review every single lesson plan. We can try. We can call it out. I'll be the first to say I've been swatting at flies. That's how I've been describing it. I'll see a lesson, and it's like, wait a minute, and I'll call it out. I will say Dr. Arnold has responded to me every single time. But we need parents. We need teachers to let us know, and we need a commitment from our um, administration that we're going to work on this together and that we're not gonna be finding those flies and the 
critical race theory and discrimination comments coming into our school. If our administrators or our teachers are making discriminatory comments, we've got to call it out and hold them accountable. So I, I don't, like I said, I didn't know exactly where this was going to go because everybody has said so much and they've said it so well. But I just want you to know that our children need to have us unified so that they can catch up on their year and a half of loss. We have a lot to work to do. And I hope that we can do it together and we can do it respectfully. And that's my commitment to you as a board member. Board members, one last chance. Okay, well, citizens of Amherst County, thank you for coming out tonight. It takes a lot of courage to stand up here and voice your opinion, so thank you for that. School board, thank you for uh, coming. My fellow board of supervisor members, thank you for being here. Um, the point of this meeting was not to have decisions come out of here. Um, it is to have a dialogue, and I think that dialogue helps us carry out our, our mission to be a vibrant and healthy community. Um, so I, I hope that these conversations continue to happen. Um, as always, you can reach out to your uh, school board member or your board of supervisor members with any concerns or feedback. Madam Chair, I move we adjourn. Motion on the floor by Mr. Rogers. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you.